What a glorious day to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. I am thrilled that everyone is here and excited on this beautiful sunny day. We're looking forward to a great time of worship and opportunity to just share in the relationships that we all have. It's my privilege to introduce our uh, guest worship leaders today. On one end, Ben Newburn. On the other end, Adam Hadges. And in the middle, our excellent praise team. They're going to kick us off this morning. If you would stand and as they let them lead us in worship. Please be seated. <clears throat> I would love to, again, welcome everyone to church this morning and remind us of what our mission here at PBC is, where we feel we are called in this world, is to help represent Jesus' love by being a simple and authentic representation of who Jesus is to the world, both here as well as out in our community. And we hope that we can show that each and every day. If you are new to Prairie Bible Church or you're trying us out, Welcome to our family. We truly see this as just kind of a family reunion every Sunday where we can gather as brothers and sisters, friends and neighbors, to love one another and love our Savior. And if you are new, we would love to just welcome you and point out a couple things. There's a little brochures back on the back hallways. 
that we'd love for you to just take one, just to get to know a little bit more about us and who we are. The other thing is we've got some simple attendance pads that I'm just going to pass around. They're in the front, so we're going to pass down. And then if you'd be willing, you just put your name down to share us that you were here today, as well as if you have an email address you want to put on there, Pastor Craig sends out a weekly email that you can put, be put on that list, just to kind of as a wonderful reminder, Jesus isn't with us just on Sunday mornings, but each and every day that we can just to be with him and love him. <clears throat> We've been talking a lot the last uh, month, really, about discipleship. We believe here at PBC that we are, as Christians, are called to three main things. We should do as Christians. Worship our Lord and Savior. Discipleship, to learn more about him and teach more about him. And then to serve. To serve here, to serve in our communities, to serve that need him. Discipleship, we've been talking a lot about recently, about how we can get to know Jesus better. How we can learn about him, how we can share him. We got another video this morning to share, uh, learn about another opportunity coming up. Uh, video series on new discipleship opportunities that we're providing here at Prairie Bible Church. Uh, my friend Crystal uh, has felt a calling from God to provide a uh, discipleship opportunity that is a little different than some of the ones that we've offered before. So I asked her if she would be willing just to share a couple of things. So my first question, Crystal, would be, how is this study, how do you perceive this study as being different, and who do you think it is? people might, what type of person might be called to it? So first of all, Crossways is different in that it's not really a class. It's more of a journey. Oh. And it's a journey that you take through both the Old Testament and the New Testament and also the Apocrypha. Together, it's an in-depth exploration. It's not about gaining information, it's about transformation. Mm. It's about studying the books of the Bible in depth and coming to understand the entire overarching story that runs completely from Genesis through Revelation. Now, I want to ask you about the Apocrypha, but we're not going to do that in this video. What I want you to do is, we, when we have our uh, discipleship fair on the t April 25th, I would invite everybody in the church to ask her about what the Apocrypha is. Okay. Okay? That's fine. Can we can, we can but that. the key that you, need to know, that you need to hear from this is this is not really a class. It really is a journey. And how long, how long if we were to do the whole thing, how long would it take? So typically, Crossways runs over the course of about two academic years. You typically start in the fall, take the summers off. We can handle it however we decide, okay. but typically you would meet once a week for an hour and a half to two hours. You would go through one unit at a time and um, for a total of 60 units. So it, obviously, it's pretty in-depth. Um, this study is for someone who's ready for that to take that next step in discipleship, really. It's not someone who's necessarily just... Um, trying to figure out how to use the Bible. This is someone who's ready to go deep and try to understand some of the history and context of what we find in the Bible, right? I would say that's true. The, I mean, the class can be applied to, you know, for anyone who's interested in reading the Bible and really gaining an in-depth understanding, but probably you should have some familiarity with it before. So when we say that it could take two academic years, you were suggesting that we might take it a unit at a time, and as a group you might decide whether you continue on to the next one or take some time off, is that what you're getting at? Um, well, so one unit would be one class, mm -hmm. and then each section, there are six sections of 10 units, and I think we would commit to one section at a time, okay. which would be 10 units. And so people side. could just commit to one unit and decide whether they like this or not? They could. Okay. Um, I would typically think that you might want to commit to one year okay. first, and that gets you at least you know halfway through. The first um, four of the six units are the Old Testament, and the last two are the New Testament. So you begin to kind of see how those bridge together. So when do you see this class starting? Have you got a plan or a strategy? I was planning for fall, so okay. probably September. Sometime so in September. Time frame, you know, we'll, we'll see who's interested, what works for everybody's schedule, and you know, pick a night that works. And, and chances are we probably meet here at the church. Here at the church. And again, it would be for an hour, hour and a half, probably an hour and a half, half, half to two, two hours. hours. Okay, so it is, it is a weekly commitment. Uh, it's it's worth it from what I have not done it myself, but you from what you said it's been very worthwhile for you, right? I started studying it on my own last summer, and I quickly I quickly determined that it's really a community thing. It's not something that's meant for someone to do individually. We learn best with and from each other. That is a great point in anything having to do with discipleship. So, so um, I I think that's probably enough. There's a lot more information we could talk about. If you, if that feels like something God's calling you to do, um, please. 
find uh, Crystal on April 25th at our discipleship fair, and she'll fill you in on more of the details. Sounds good. Thank you. Now, if anybody's wondering if you have to wait 11 and a half months on April 25th to meet with Crystal, no. That video was done before last week. Uh, for those of you that were here, we had that discipleship fair. Uh, certainly, Crystal's excited about getting that started in the fall, and you could reach out to her at some point in the spring and summer to kind of learn more about that program. But also, it's a great reminder <clears throat> of the discipleship fair, and we had about eight different tables, eight different ways that we can plug in in a way to learn more about Jesus and to be able to get more involved and also just be in a small group to know more about our friends and neighbors here, too, and build those relationships. One of the studies did start this morning. Uh, John and Karen Wagner kicked off before service every Sunday, at least in perpetuity, really, John? Yeah, forever and ever. Uh, 8.15, 8.15, education wing. They're going through the book of Genesis right now, beginnings. It's kind of a study of beginnings. It's still open and welcome for anybody that wants to do that. And then after service this morning, uh, Deb Hughes is leading one in the education wing as well to kind of do an afterglow, to talk about the sermon and what we just talked about here and to dive in deeper into the scripture that was there. And that's going to kick off probably 15, 20 minutes after service. 10, 15 minutes, I grab a coffee in a bathroom, head to the education wing, open to anybody. Hope that you are interested in doing that. One of the one that we talked about last week, um, Edge Venture, that Steve had put together and kind of was talking about or helping guide us with, that has been postponed. It was going to be in May going to be postponed probably till this fall, but if you have any questions about that and we're thinking about it, you can catch Steve as well. I just want to make sure people know about that. Um, and it's excited as that was, the discipleship fair, as I talked about, worship, discipleship, and service that we're called to. May 16th, in a couple of weeks, we're going to have a ministry fair to kind of help with service. So be on the lookout for that. We're excited about what that can be and how we can plug in that way as well. With a lot going on. I would invite you to come to the Lord with me in prayer this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you humbly as your servants, as your children, looking for guidance and direction and love, and so thankful that you are our ever-present, unchanging Savior and Lord. And we thank you for that, Lord. <clears throat> I thank you for this family reunion as we talk about, that we can come together on Sunday mornings to love one another and the relationships we have here it's not our most important priority. I know that. We are here to worship you, how great you are and how much you deserve our worship. But you've also made us for community and for relationship. And I can't think of a better group of people to be in relationship with. Those that are here in person and those that are with us in spirit and online, that we can all come together to love one another and to love you. Lord, I pray for this coming week and this opportunity that we have as spring continues to unfold and you continue to guide and lead Prairie Bible Church and all of us that are here. And we ask for your guidance, your direction, and your love. Lord, we're excited about the future. The unknown, not knowing where you got us. But we pray, Lord, that you would help us, direct us, how you want us to give your mission in this world. You've blessed us with this beautiful facility to share in our community. You've blessed us with hands and feet, mouths and ears to go out into our community, to share your story, to do your work. We pray, Lord, that as we go through the discipleship fair, as we look to the ministry fair, that you will open up the opportunities and the doors for each and every one of us to make an impact. Your world so badly needs your message. Help us to do that. And remind us, it's not about impacting every person on the planet Earth. It's just impacting our neighbor, impacting our friend, one person, one soul at a time. We're so thankful that you provide us that opportunity to do it. And I pray for this worship service as we come together to keep you the focus, you the priority. Allow our songs, the music to your ears, the message that we hear to come directly from you, to fill us. We pray that you would help us to go out in the world and spread that message. We ask all this in Jesus Christ's name.
Amen.
Are you hurting and broken today? Overwhelmed by the weight of sin, Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of the cell? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. short children's message. Good to see all you guys. Good, we have a few more coming too. Awesome. All right. 
Who remembers what we were learning about last week? We used cotton balls to make a project. Maybe that'll, it's an I am statement. Jacob, I am the gate. Exactly. Thank you. We're going to keep that in our brain, but now I'm going to switch gears a little bit. I'm going to play a quick game, and I want, want you guys to guess who I am seeing. I know someone with an orange shirt. Who might that be? Not that orange shirt. <laughs> yes, Drake! Drake is pointing at himself. I know someone um, that has an orange shirt, khaki uh, shorts, and black shoes on. That's still Drake. Yes, those are more characteristics of Drake. But if I said, okay, I know Drake has an orange shirt on and khaki pants and black shoes, do I really know Drake? No. I know a lot about Drake. I know he has a sucker and, and some kind of beautiful hair, and, and he's very wiggly. I know all those things about Drake. <laughs> but that doesn't really tell me who Drake is. And thank goodness I have had the privilege, along with Jill and Jennifer and Cindy and Laura and Brenda, to spend time in class with Drake. And we know lots about Drake, just like we know about you guys, too. For example, Drake loves Herky. I know that. And he also um, loves Spider-Man and occasionally dresses like Spider-Man. And he has a passion. If you ever visit Drake's house, he wants to show you his room. That's another passion of his, because he likes to share things. Oh, Henry's correcting me. It's Batman. Batman Drake? Yeah. All, all. And PG Mask. All superheroes. So that's so much deeper than his orange shirt and his black shoes, right? So we've been learning a lot, and I always like to re remind ourselves, we've been learning a lot of words from the Bible. We've been defining words. We've been looking at the metaphors that Jesus is presenting. But guys, we can't stop there. It's not about those basic facts. It's about a relationship. Those are some tools that help get us there. Like if we say, yes, there's a man with an orange shirt, we know that gets us to Drake. But to really, really know him, we got to spend time together. And how do we spend time with Jesus? In his word, in worship, listening, and through prayer. So just because we know some scripture, just because we know some facts, it's not enough. Jesus asked us to know him, and God asked us to know who he is. So we're going to take time to do that. I just want to give that reminder out to us every few months, because it's really, really important that we know so much more than just what's in here. We know his love. Can you guys pray with me? Heavenly Father, please fill us. Fill our hearts and our minds with your love and your truth. May the scriptures be our avenue to get there. But may the greatest, greatest peace be our relationship with you, a relationship that's deep and wide, and a relationship that helps us take the next step forward in love for our neighbor. In your name we pray. All God's children said, My name is Sarah, and today I'm going to be reading Acts 10, verses 15. What God has called clean, you must not call common. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, there's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus. Like the sunshine after the rain. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away but there'll still be something about that name 
Lord Jesus, we have come on this beautiful Sunday morning for You. Because we love You. And we know that we have been created and called to worship You with with every breath that we breathe. And when we do it together as the body of Christ, when we worship together as the body of Christ, there is something even more beautiful and profound that occurs. Um, I'm asking, Savior, in the midst of our worship, now as we worship You, as delving into the Scripture, that Your Holy Spirit would... would, um, fall upon us, indwell us, empower us. That You would take the scales from our eyes as we, as we seek to understand Your Word better. As we seek to have Your Word mold us. As we seek to have Your Word be the, the lens from which we view the world and all that is going on in it. Let Your Holy Spirit move, Lord. We claim the promise found in Isaiah 55.11. This is truly when it is Your words that go out, they shall not come back empty. And it is my prayer this morning, Jesus, that, that um, the words spoken will be Your word. And if there's anything that I would say that I'm, in, I'm intending to say or I'm tempted to say, Lord, that is not of You, don't let me say it. Just confuse my mind and um, move me off in the right direction because I don't want to mislead Your people. So let Your Spirit be and do the work that You want done in us today as we worship You. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Um, I want to tell you uh, a little story. When I was 40 years old, I went through something of a little mini midlife crisis. I say mini midlife crisis because really it was kind of inconsequential. Nobody even knew I was going through it except for my wife and maybe some close friends. Um, though I don't want to, by the way, it wasn't, I did not have a, an affair. I didn't go out and buy a sports car or anything like that. It was, is much simpler than that. Though I will, if I was to be honest, it, um, to some people, what, how my midlife crisis played itself out may have been a big deal. So what was it? When I was 40 years old, I went out and got a tattoo. Uh, it's uh, it, it, I told you, it's not a big deal, right? <laughs> now, for those of you who are wondering about my tattoo, you've probably never seen it. The reason why you've never seen it is because you haven't seen me with my shirt off. Because it's it's a it's right goes right down my vertebrae, right between my shoulder blades, right be, um, on my vertebrae, and it's it's it says Jesus on it. Pretty radical, huh? Rebellious. Um, now I want I want to for those of you who may have been thinking about getting a tattoo but you haven't pulled the trigger yet. Let me give you a little personal uh, testimony about it. It's not nearly as as painful as you might think, unless you happen to get your tattoo on a place on your body where there's not a lot of meat. You know what I mean? If you happen to get like on your spine, for example. Uh, to this day, I can, my teeth are still rattling from the tattoo needle going up and down my spine. Now, I'm not asking anybody to feel sorry for me, okay? In fact, some of you are thinking, uh, you deserve it stupid, right? <laughs> That's exactly what my mom's thinking right over there. But on a more serious note, some of you might be thinking, Pastor, that was a sin. It says so in the Bible. And if you were thinking that, um, you're right, kind of. So hang on to that for just a second. This morning, I want to, um, as we continue our journey through um, the New Testament book of Acts, I want you to think of that story I just told you in relation along with the story that we're going to be uh, looking at in Acts chapter 10. And as we're looking at these two stories or considering these two stories that I'm, I want to have shared and one I'm going to share with you, um, I want you to ask yourself a question. This is a question that was raised in my mind this week as I was studying. Does God ever change His mind? As you're pondering that, I want you to open up 
your Bibles to Acts chapter 10. Would you do that for me? And as you're doing that, I'm going to, I, I need to take a little extra time this morning to kind of lay a biblical and historical foundation for the passage of Scripture that we're going to be looking at more than I usually do, but I think it's worth it and necessary. So you get turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 10, uh, and as you're doing that, let me just say this. The, the 10,000 foot view of what is happening in Acts chapter 10 is this. Um, God is asking the Apostle Peter to step outside of his comfort zone here in Acts chapter 10. And the way he's asking him to step outside of his comfort zone is that God is asking Peter to share the Gospel or to share Jesus with a man named Cornelius who um, is a Gentile, by the way. Now, that which means he's a non-Jew, which means he's like you and me. He's a non-Jew, and that's very important, and that's, that's the thing that makes it uncomfortable for um, Peter. Now, the question is, why is that such a big deal? Even for someone, I mean, you wouldn't think sharing the gospel would be hard for someone who's, who actually saw the resurrection, right? You wouldn't think that sharing the gospel would be difficult for someone who, um, who, who was the leader of the church, the early church, right? Well, to explain to you why that is, why that was difficult, um, we need to go back to the Old Testament and look at some things. So, the reason why that was so difficult for Peter, is because ever since the time of Abraham, go all the way back to the Old Testament book of Genesis, ever since the time of Abraham, God had been telling the Jews that they were His chosen people. Very important. God has been um, telling them that, that, he, that they are His chosen people and He has set them apart for a very specific and powerful purpose. He, he um, continues that, that same theme all throughout the Old Testament, as a matter of fact. And he reminds them over and over again that because they are his chosen people, they are to remain distinct from the rest of the world, from other peoples and other cultures. Very important. God is so serious about the people of of, of Israel, the Jews, remaining distinct from other cultures and religions that in, if you look in the Old Testament book of Leviticus, uh, chapter 17 through 26, he spends nine chapters of the Bible establishing laws. Well, actually, they've become, these nine chapters have become known as, as the holiness codes. Very important to remember. He spends nine chapters explaining to the Jews the things they are to do and the things they are not to do in order to remain distinct from the rest of the world. Among those, inside of those nine chapters, if you look in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 28, God tells the Jews, listen, don't get a tattoo. <laughs> See, Pastor, I told you it was in there. You're not supposed to. All right, now listen to me because I'm going to ask you to do some critical thinking. It's hard for some of us. <laughs> critical thinking is as simple as asking why. Nine chapters, Leviticus chapters 17 through 26, all dedicated to God saying to the Jews, do these things. Don't do these things. Why? To, re- to maintain your distinctiveness from the rest of the world. So listen now, because this is where it gets a little more complicated. You have to ask why that is such a, such a big deal. Why is it so important to God that he would spend nine chapters in the Bible saying to his people, remain distinct. Don't allow yourself to become absorbed into the culture. The answer, that answer is actually very simple. It's because God, as God's chosen people, God had a plan 
probably the most important and powerful plan that the world has ever known for those people. And the plan actually has a name. You may want to take a guess at what the name of the plan is. Jesus. The plan that God had was that through the Jews, they had to remain distinct. They had to remember their cultural and religious identity because God would use the Jews to bring Jesus into the world. The plan of salvation. That's a big, big deal. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. Amen. So God, in an effort to make sure that the Jews remain distinct from the rest of the culture and the rest of the world, um, gave them things that they should do or not do. Things like, do not blend two different kinds of fabrics together as a reminder to remain distinct from the world. One of those things you'll find in the holiness code. Another thing it said is, don't, uh, don't go out and get tattoos like the Gentiles. As a reminder to remain distinct from the world. Don't eat uh, meat that the Gentiles eat. Some kinds of meats like the Gentiles eat. Why? Well, there's more than one reason, but one of them, probably the most important reason, was as a reminder to remain distinct from the world. See where this is going? So, I know that took a lot longer than um, I usually take to set up the Scripture, but here we are now in Acts chapter 10. All that's important for you to even understand what's going on in Acts chapter 10. So we remember, God has asked um, Peter to step outside his comfort zone to go and share the Gospel with a guy named Cornelius who is what? He's a Gentile. And why was that a big deal? Because the Jews had convinced themselves that when God told them to remain distinct, they interpreted that as being separate. That is not what God meant. God never intended the Jews to be separate from you and me. He intended them to be distinct from you and me. Difference, right? But because the Jews culturally had thought, I'm not supposed to have anything to do with people like Jennifer, to ask um, Peter to go and witness to someone like Cornelius was like, no way. He responds when, when um, so this is what happens. Uh, God realizes that he needs to reset Peter's way of thinking. So, this is Acts chapter 10. One day, it says that Peter goes up on the roof before breakfast, get a little sun, maybe to pray a little bit. And while he's up on the roof, he goes into a trance or he has a vision. It says in Acts chapter 10. And this is the vision. Strangest thing you'd ever heard. As he's up there on the roof before breakfast, he's kind of getting hungry, but he's praying before breakfast. He has this vision where the sheet comes down from heaven and there's all these animals in the sheet that the holiness code says are unclean. Jews aren't supposed to have anything to do with them. Why? To remain distinct from the, from the world. Well, as this, this sheep comes down from heaven, his stomach's growling. Doesn't really say that, but it is. <laughs> his stomach's growling, and this voice from heaven says, I know you're hungry. Eat! And you know what Peter says? I shan't because I am a good Jew. That's in the King James. Peter says, no, I'm not going to eat those animals because I'm a good Jew. And Jews aren't supposed to do that. Acts chapter 10, verse 15. Sarah read it for you. What does it say? That which God has made clean Don't you call and unco- don't you call common? Well, what does that mean? Well, there's a there's kind of two layers to that answer. The first one is the 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 micro level. Well, these God says, I know you think you've got this figured out, but you don't. If I tell you to go and witness to Cornelius, do it. 
don't call that which I have made clean unclean or common. The bigger picture was that God was continuing a paradigm shift that started all the way back in Acts chapter 7. And the paradigm shift that started in Acts chapter 7, I'm not going to go into it because I don't have time, but was when, remember that seemingly unimportant detail that said, and in the crowd that day was a young man named Saul? The paradigm shift that God is continuing here is He's saying it's time for the planned focus to, to stop being on the distinctiveness of the Jews and to start focusing on the world. That's what's going on here. Now, because the plan all along was for God to invite you, all of us, into the family. Now remember, remember before when I, I, I had those two questions or those two stories in front of you and I said, Did, does this mean that God changes His mind? Because in the Old Testament it appears that God said don't eat these animals and then in the New Testament He says it's okay to eat these animals. So God changed His mind, right? Well, consider this. And this is very, very important for you to understand. In Matthew 5.17, Jesus said this. He said, I did not come into the world to abolish the law or to change the law. I came to fulfill it. Listen to me. God does never, He does not change. He has never changed. He's been the same yesterday, today, and forever. It says that both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. God never changes. Why that's so important for you to grasp and understand is that you, are, you find yourself in a cultural and a world upheaval right now where it feels like everything has changed. And you say, well, God changes too. God does not change. Listen to me. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And people will take scriptures like these or these, these things that I've shared with you today and say, well, see, God changes too. God does not change. God's truth is forever and ever the same. God's plan has always been the same. And the plan is this. From the very beginning, it was God's plan to save you. It, it, from the very beginning, it was God's plan to save anyone who would accept Jesus, the plan, as salvation, for salvation. That was the plan all along, and He's never wavered from it. And God, more than anything else, wants you to be a part of His family. He's not going to make you. He yearns for it. He will woo you into the family, but He will not make you. It's your choice. And maybe today is the day that you should make that choice. Because it's not good enough that you simply came to worship today. It's not good enough that you went to Sunday school when you were a kid. It's not good enough that you pray once in a while. You have to make the conscious decision to invite Jesus into your heart as Lord and Savior. And if you can't remember ever having done that, you need to. And maybe today is that day. As the band comes up to lead us in our final um, song of worship, if you would like to pray that prayer of salvation, that prayer of becoming part of the family, I'm right over there, that open door is the, the prayer room. Um, I'll be standing right over there. If, you need any, if any of you need prayer for anything else, I know that there's some concerns going on in our congregation uh, right now, and if you'd like prayer with your pastor for anything, it'd be my privilege right over there. Let's stand and sing, church. Every heart. 
Yesterday, today, tomorrow. And I would tell you, I think there's somebody here, at least one person here is pretty passionate about that. Craig Peters seems like he's fired up. He wants to make sure you know that, doesn't he? What a great messenger that the God has sent us to help tell that story. Thank you, worship team, for leading us this morning in a great worship. Would you all pray with me as we close? Lord, we thank you. Thank you for being that unchanging, everlasting, always loving Savior. And we pray each and every day that we will let you be our Lord to truly follow you and follow your direction. And it's a wonderful reminder to me, Lord, as I go from this past week and we go into this coming week, of the chaos that can surround us. Your plan is there. Your purpose is good. All we need to do is come to you. Take up our cross and follow you. And we are thankful, so thankful for that wonderful gift. I pray that you would help each and every one of us remember that focus on you this coming week. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. It's great to see you. Have a great week. We'll see you next week.
Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your 